another episode of staring into the abyss i am your host horror author james hershey jr and with me as always is old boy james ash how you doing brother pretty good how are you guys doing misfits sugar ladies and demon hunters i'm doing pretty good brother on today's episode we are going to be talking about uh, lake monsters and in particular we're going to be talking about nessie who is probably the most well-known and best example of a lake monster there's also a Champ from Lake Champlain, there's Ogo Pogo, there's there's a couple other ones. But Nessie's the main one, so we'll, we'll cover uh, Nessie, and I want to go through a little bit of the photographic evidence today, some of which looks to be fairly good evidence, and some of it looks to be complete and total hoaxes. Then we'll kind of talk a little bit about Nessie and, and try to figure out, one, if this thing exists, and two, if it does, what the hell is it? The first actual photograph of Nessie was taken on December 6, 1933, and it was taken by a guy named Hugh Gray, and the photograph was published in the Daily Express, and it caused kind of a stir, because the Secretary of State for Scotland saw the photograph in the Daily Express, and he ordered the police to prevent anybody from attacking the monster. He didn't want Nessie to be, to be hurt. In 1934, there was the famous picture that we've all seen that's called the, the surgeon's photograph. And that's the one that you see the, the neck and the head coming up. It's like a shadowy looking thing. That's the one that when, when you talk about Nessie, everybody knows that photograph. That photograph we'll go into a little bit when we go through the evidence. There, there are some problems with that photograph and we'll talk about it. The first picture was taken in 1933, but the actual accounts of this monster, the sightings, date all the way back to like the 6th century. The actual earliest report of the Loch Ness Monster appeared in The Life of St. Columba, which was written by uh, Adaman in the 6th century. And according to Adaman, the Irish monk St. Columba was staying in the land of the Picts, and he encountered the local residents. They were burying a man by the river. Okay, because Loch Ness has a little river they call the River Ness that, that feeds it. He encountered the local residents burying a man there. and. He spoke with them, and they had explained that the man was was swimming in the River Ness, and he was attacked by what they described as a water beast. And they said that this water beast mauled the man and then dragged him underwater. They tried to mount a rescue with a boat, but by the time they got to the guy, he was dead. And Columbus sent one of his followers to swim across the river and collect the guy. And he said that the beast approached him, 
But then Columba made the sign of the cross and he said, and this is a quote, go no further, do not touch the man, go back at once. And he said, once he said that and made the sign of the cross, the creature stopped and it took off. It like swam away. And then Columba's men gave thanks because they said it was like a miracle and all this. This is the first ever mention of the Loch Ness Monster. But you'll see as we talk about this a little bit that there are a lot of other characteristics that you're probably not familiar with. Um, the next sighting was in 1871 by a guy named D. McKenzie. He reportedly saw an object resembling a log or an upturned boat that was moving around in the water. He said that it moved slowly at first and then when it disappeared it, it went very quickly. Uh, he sent a story in a letter to Rupert Gold in 1934. Shortly after that is when Nessie really started becoming popular. In 1933, George Spicer and his wife saw what they described as, quote, a most extraordinary form of animal. And they this is when it starts to get kind of interesting because there's other characteristics of the animal that we just never heard before. And they said they saw it cross the road in front of their car. This means that this creature is not just lake bound, that it can actually leave the water and move around. That is extremely important when we are trying to figure out what this thing could possibly be. They describe the creature as having a large body. They say it was about four foot with a long, wavy, narrow neck. They said the neck was slightly thicker than an elephant's trunk and that it was around 10 to 12 feet long. The, the interesting thing about that is they said that they saw no limbs. So the creature didn't have any arms or legs is what they're saying. And it kind of lurched its way across the road. It traveled about 20 yards because the lock was about 20 yards away from the road. So it crossed the road and traveled that distance to go into the water. In the beginning, it was a remote area, Loch Ness was. Uh, they began construction in that area around that time period. And there was always a little road there, but it wasn't a very passable road. So when they started doing the construction, they improved the road. And at that point, when, when the road was made better and more people began traveling there, that is when a lot of the sightings really started to pick up. And you started having a lot more eyewitness accounts. On the next one is another photograph. It was taken by Hugh Gray in 1933. This was the first photograph that was supposed to actually show the monster. It was a little bit blurry. They, they say that if you examine the photograph closely, if you blow it up and mess with the contrast a little bit, that it looks like the head of a dog. That's important because Gray had taken his dog, his Labrador, for a walk that day. What the people that examine the photograph are thinking is that the photograph actually shows his dog fetching a stick from the lock. They're thinking maybe because you can see the, the head of a dog when you blow it up, maybe it's just an out of fo focus picture of him playing with his dog. Other people that have examined the photograph say that they think that it might be an otter or a swan. The original negative to the picture was lost. But in 1963, Maurice Burton came into possession of two of the slides, which were contact positives from the original negative. When he projected them on the screen, he says that it revealed an otter rolling at the surface in characteristic fashion. On January 5th, 1934, this guy named Arthur Grant, who was riding a motorcycle, claimed that he nearly hit the creature while he was approaching the northeastern end of the lock. Now, this is another one that, that says that Nessie was actually out on the road. Okay, this took place around 1 a.m., and he said that the moon was out that night. It was very bright, so he was able to see it very well. According to Grant, uh, the creature had a small head that was attached to a very long neck. He said that the creature saw him and then darted back across the road into the lock. Now, Grant was a veterinary student, and he says that the creature to him looked like a cross between a seal and a plesiosaur. So this is the first time that the theory of the Loch Ness Monster being a plesiosaur entered the discussion. Um, he said that he got off his motorcycle and he tried to follow the creature down to the water to see it again, but he only saw ripples, basically. He drew a sketch of what the creature looked like. The same guy, Maurice Burton, the zoologist, he examined the sketch and he said that it was consistent with the appearance and behavior of an otter. I have seen the sketch myself. In no way does this sketch resemble an otter at all to me. When I look at this sketch, I do not think otter. Honestly, when I, when I look at this sketch, I think brontosaurus or some other form of dinosaur like that. That's what it looks like. It does not in any way look like an otter. I don't see how he can look at this and say otter because otters don't have 
real long ass necks. They don't have, they're not gigantic. I mean, this thing looks like something off the Flintstones. So to me, there's absolutely no way that anybody could realistically and logically look at this thing and say, oh yeah, that's an otter. You know, if, if you didn't even tell me what the sketch was from, if you just showed it to me and said, hey, what is this a picture of? What is this a drawing of? The very last thing in the world I would say would be otter. You know what I mean? I would say dinosaur before I would say anything, because that's what it looks like. And then if you pressed me, I would say, I wouldn't even say plesiosaur, because it doesn't look like a plesiosaur to me. A plesiosaur did not have feet. It had, like, flipper-like things on the end of, of, its, of its arms and legs. This thing has feet. It looks like something off the Flintstones, honestly. The next piece of evidence is the famous surgeon's photograph I was talking about before. And this was taken uh, April 21st of 1934. That's at least when it was first published in the Daily Mail. Uh, we're not exactly sure when it was actually taken, but that's when it was published. Now, the guy that published it was a guy named Robert Kenneth Wilson. Uh, he was a gynecologist in London. The reason they call it the surgeon's photograph is because Wilson did not want to have his name associated with the picture because he was a doctor and he did not want his reputation to suffer from showing a picture of a mythical creature. He knew that people would probably call him a crackpot and he did not want his reputation to suffer. According to Wilson, he was looking at the lock and he saw the monster. Once he saw the monster, he, he grabbed his camera and he quickly tried to snap pictures. He ended up getting four pictures of it. Only two of the pictures that he took actually came out. First was the picture that we're all familiar with. It shows the, the small head and the long neck and, and a bit of the back. Second picture also shows the head. Okay, it looks a lot like the head in the first picture, but it's in a diving position and the rest of it is just blurry. So you can't really make out much other than the, the head in the second photo. The first photo became very well known. Everybody's seen it. The second photo was pretty much left in obscurity. Nobody really knows that it even exists, but it does. Now, for a great deal of time, that photo was considered the absolute best evidence of the Loch Ness Monster. A couple of the problems with the picture was the scale. Nobody really knew how large the thing was because the photo that we've all seen was cropped. So we, we never got to really see the original picture. So in the crop picture, it looks like it's a very large creature that is in the middle of the lock. The ripples around it look like waves that are going across. So it looks like a very large creature that is displacing a great deal of water. The uncropped shot kind of shows something different. The uncropped shot shows the other end of the lock and it shows the monster in the center. And the ripples in the photo that is uncropped they don't look quite as impressive at all. They kind of look like real small ripple. They don't look like large waves like the crop photo that zoomed in. So they did an analysis of that original image. They, it started to raise a lot of doubt. Um, in 1993, Discovery did a documentary called uh, Loch Ness Discovered. And they actually analyzed the uncropped image. And they found a strange white object that was visible in every single version of the photo which means basically that it was present on the negative. And they believe that that is what was causing the ripples. To them and the experts that examined it for the show, they said that it looked as if the object was being towed. What that would tell you, it wasn't a creature, it was something that was being pulled along to make it look like it was moving basically and it caused ripples. And analysis of the photograph also showed that the object wasn't gigantic at all. It was actually very small. It was only two to three feet long. That right there tells you that if that is correct, that the most famous photograph of the Loch Ness Monster was really only a couple feet. It, it was most likely a model or like a toy of some sort. Basically, since that thing came out, since it aired in, in late 93, early 94, all the experts agree that the photo was a hoax. Um, it was actually accused of being a fake long before that. On December 7th, 1975, a Sunday Telegraph article called it out as being a hoax. And there was a book that was published in 1999 called uh, Nessie, the Surgeon's Photograph Exposed. It contained a copy of that 1975 Sunday Telegraph article. And they stated there in the article that the creature was a toy submarine that was built by a guy named Christian Sperling, who was the son-in-law of Marmaduke Wetherill. Now, uh, Wetherill had been publicly ridiculed by his employer, which just happened to be the Daily Mail. 
It was the newspaper that first published the photograph. The reason that he had been ridiculed is because he had supposedly found Nessie footprints and he tried to get them covered by the paper and they did an investigation and they realized that these footprints were actually a hoax, that they weren't real. They ridiculed him publicly and that pissed him off. So basically to get revenge on the Daily Mail, the theory is that Wetherill decided he was going to do a hoax with Sperling, who was a sculpture specialist, and his son Ian and somebody named Maurice Chambers, which is an insurance agent. They bought the toy submarine from F.W. Woolworths, and they made the head and the neck that you see in the picture from wood putty. There was actually a test done in a local pond. They built a model that looked just like the one in the picture, and it was built to scale of what they say that the thing was in the picture. And they took it to that pond, and they towed it, and they took pictures. And they were able to perfectly recreate the famous surgeon photo. Right after they got done taking the pictures, they heard a water bailiff approaching, and when they heard him coming, Duke Wetherill actually stepped on the model and sank it down under the water with his feet and mushed it into the, into the mud of the lock. Presumably, it is still buried there in the mud of, of Loch Ness, and I would like to see somebody actually go and find it. That would be very interesting to me to have it actually discovered, because if somebody could discover that toy submarine and that model that's still buried in that mud, then they could prove definitively once and for all that it's a complete and total fake because see nobody nobody ever admitted that the surgeon photo was was a fake that it was a hoax in any way um they never had anybody admit that what you have here is you have people that have tried to debunk the photograph and they're saying this is what happened this is what they've proven they say that chambers gave the photograph to wilson and wilson brought the plates to a chemist who gave them to george morrison to get developed and then once they were developed he sold the, the uh, photos to the Daily Mail or at least he sold the one that everybody knows to the Daily Mail and then the Daily Mail came out publicly and announced that the Loch Ness Monster had been photographed. The next one is actually a film that was taken in 1938. There was a South African tourist named G.E. Taylor. He actually saw something in the lock and he filmed it and it's a three minute film that he filmed on 16 millimeter color film. The film was actually obtained by popular science writer Maurice Burton, who did not show it to the other researchers. But he did publish a single frame from the film in his 1961 book, The Elusive Monster. According to him, he concluded that the object in the film was not an animal, but it was a floating object. Once again, this is a case where we don't know how he came to that conclusion. We don't know what his analysis consisted of. We don't know what kind of experiments were done to come to that conclusion. There is no real evidence there. We just have some guy that wrote a book saying, this is what it is. It's not an animal, it's a floating object. But I have no information that tells me how he came to that conclusion. On August 15th, 1938, a chief constable of Irvineshire named William Fraser wrote a letter that the monster existed beyond a shadow of a doubt. And he expressed concern about a hunting party that had arrived there at the lock. This hunting party had made a custom-made harpoon gun, and they claimed that they were going to capture the monster. Whether they had to kill it or bring it in alive didn't matter. They were going to get the monster once and for all. Basically, what he wanted to do was to protect the monster from the hunters, but he didn't believe that he was going to be able to do that, so he decided he was going to release this letter. Okay, now we're going to get a little bit more into the modern era, and this is one from 1954 in December of 1954. This has to do with sonar readings. There was a fishing boat named the Rival 3. It actually did sonar readings on Loch Ness. This has been done multiple times since 1954. They found that there was a large object that was traveling under the water of the lock, and it was keeping pace with their boat at a depth of 479 feet. They actually had sonar pings from it for 2,600 feet before they lost contact. After they lost contact, they regained contact for a short amount of time, and they lost it again. So basically, this creature was traveling almost 500 feet down in the lock, and it followed the boat for over 2,500 feet before it broke away and, and went somewhere else. They had tried to do sonar readings before that point, but they came back either inconclusive or negative for any, any pings. But in 1954, they actually got a ping of a large creature. Um, the next one is by Peter McNabb in 1955. He took a photograph of two long black humps in the water. He didn't actually make the, the photograph public until 
1957 when it appeared in Constant White's book about Nessie. On October 23rd of 1958, it was also published by the Weekly Scotsman. There's been a lot of theories of, of, of what those things could be. Some people say that it was just a wave. Other people have, have said that it's, it's wood pieces. Other people have said that it's wind ripples. There, there's been all kinds of theories on what it could be. That's what the skeptics say. And I'm trying to give you both sides here of, of what the evidence is and then what the skeptics say about it. Although to me, if every time you try to disprove something, you just say the same thing. And when you look at it, it doesn't look like that. That kind of hurts your credibility. That sketch that I was talking about earlier, when the guy said, he was supposedly an expert, he's a zoologist, when he said that it looked like an otter, that that's what it was. And then I look at the actual drawing and there's no way in hell you can look at this thing and say it's an otter. To me, that's like, okay, you're just trying to, to explain it away any way you can. You don't actually see an otter there. Nobody could see an otter there because it's not an otter. It's a dinosaur. You're just trying to come up with any excuse you can. I kind of look at this one the same way. you got two black humps in the water. They're obviously two black humps, okay? It's not a wave. It's not a ripple. It's two objects in the water. Whether that is something that was created and put in the water, that's more believable than in saying it's a wave because when you look at it it doesn't look like a wave i think that hurts these skeptics a lot and at least in my view if you're going to try to explain something be reasonable about it at least you know if something obviously looks like a dinosaur don't call it an otter if something looks like two humps in the water don't tell me it's a wave because i know damn well it's not a wave um, the next one is another film it was by an aeronautical engineer named tim dindale he filmed a hump which left a wake crossing over Loch Ness. This was in 1960. Supposedly, Densdale had went out looking for the Loch Ness monster. On the very final day of his search, he had this sighting. And he said that the creature was reddish in color and it had a blotch on its side. He said that when he got his camera together and got ready to take the picture, the creature began to move and he was able to get a short amount of film. A lot of the experts say that the object in this film was most likely an animate object. So they're saying that it was something that was alive. In that documentary that Discovery did, they did a digital enhancement of the Densdale film. And the person who enhanced the film noticed a shadow in the negative of the film, which you couldn't see once the film was developed. Now they enhanced and overlaid the frames. What they found when they did that was the rear body of the creature that was underwater. Basically what that tells me is that you had what was visible above the water in the film. And then in the actual negative, you had a shadow. And when they overlaid it and, and enhanced it, they saw that that shadow that they saw in the negative was the body of the creature. So that is not a man in the boat as the skeptics claim. That is a creature that has a body that is under the water. The experts who examine this footage, now keep in mind, these people, these experts were trying to debunk this footage just like they debunked the other. So they weren't believers that were trying to find an excuse to show that the creature was real. It was exactly the opposite. They were skeptics that were trying to disprove this piece of footage. What they ended up doing is showing that it was a real creature because they showed the body that was under the water. They were actually quoted as saying, one of the experts, before I saw the film, I thought the Loch Ness Monster was a load of rubbish. Having done the enhancement, I'm not so sure. So that's one of the people that actually did the enhancing of the film for the Discovery Channel documentary who thought it was garbage, thought it was, you know, not a real creature, and now he's not so sure. He's He doesn't think that it was a hoax. The next one is another photograph that was taken uh, May 21st, 1977, by uh, Anthony Doc Shields. He went camping up there at the lock, and he took some of the clearest pictures of the monster. A couple things that, to me, are a problem with, with Shields, uh, not necessarily the pictures, but with Shields himself. He is a magician and claims to be a psychic. Now, Shields claims that he didn't just happen upon the creature. He claims that he was actually able to summon the creature out of the water. And he says that the creature is actually an elephant squid and that the long neck that you see in the photograph is actually the trunk of the squid and that the white spot at the base of the neck is actually the squid's eye. Basically, when you look at the photograph, there's there's zero ripples. There's no ripples. So it's not a creature that has come up out of the water that's moving at all. It's something that's been sitting there for a while. And due to the lack of rip, ripples, basically they declared that it was a hoax. 
and also because when you look at the picture it, it just looks a little bit too staged and when you take into account that the guy is a magician and claims to be a psychic then to me it it just it stinks it, it doesn't smell like a like a real thing at all it smells like a staged hoax the next one is another video uh, may 26 2007 a 55 year old laboratory technician named gordon holmes videotaped what he said was quote a jet black thing about 14 meters which is 46 feet long moving fairly fast in the water now a marine biologist at the loch ness 2000 center had described this footage as among the best footage he had ever seen and bbc scotland actually broadcast a video on may 29th of 2007 which is three days after it was shot stv news north tonight aired the footage on the 28th of may and they actually interviewed holmes shine was also interviewed who was the marine biologist once he was interviewed he suggested that the footage was an otter a seal or a water bird so here you have this guy that at first said that it was was the best footage he had ever seen and then a couple days later when he goes on tv to be interviewed about it he claims that it was an otter a seal or a water bird to me it's interesting that that he changed his, his tune a little bit how do you go from saying this is the best footage i've ever seen to saying that you think it's an otter to me that makes no sense the next one is another sonar image this happened on august 24th of 2011 and a loch ness boat captain named marcus atkinson photographed a sonar image of a 4 foot 11 inch unidentified object which seemed to follow his boat for two minutes and it was at a depth of 75 feet he ruled out the possibility of a small fish or a seal to be fair in april 2012 a scientist from the national oceanography center said that the image is a bloom of algae or it's zooplankton to me the size of this sonar image is the problem it's four foot 11 inches so it's just under five foot now that's not saying it can't be the loch ness monster but if it is then it must be a baby which in a way would make sense because if you have sightings of this thing going all the way back to the sixth century this is not a single solitary supernatural creature this is something that has to have a breeding population to stay alive that long and it also goes to reason that if you have the same creature in Lake Champlain and you have Ogopogo as well and several other lake monsters that resemble Loch Ness monster if you have multiple of these creatures in multiple locations then there must be more than one that's just logical in order for there to still be Loch Ness monsters then there has to be a breeding population of these creatures a little five foot creature might be a baby the next one is George Edwards, who was a skipper, August 3rd, 2012. He published what he claimed was the most convincing Nessie photograph ever. He said he took the picture on November 2nd of 2011. Basically, the picture shows a hump sticking out of the water. He said that it was there for five or 10 minutes and he took a picture of it. According to Edwards, the photograph was independently verified by a specialist and a group of U.S. military monster experts. Edwards reportedly spent 60 hours per week on the lock. He's been searching for the Loch Ness Monster for, he says, 26 years. And he says that, in his opinion, the Loch Ness Monster looks like a manatee. He said when people see three humps, they're probably just seeing three separate monsters. A lot of researchers have questioned this photograph's authenticity. Steve Feldman, who is a Nessie researcher, has suggested that what the object in the water actually is is a fiberglass hump that was used in a national geographic channel documentary in which uh edwards had actually participated in that documentary and he claims that what happened was edwards took that fiberglass hump from that documentary put it in the water and took a picture of it i don't know whether this thing is a hoax or not but it does not fit with all of the other pictures of nessu that we have because usually when you have pictures of just the humps, it's multiple humps, either two or three. In this case, it's a single hump. Uh, the next one is a video by David Elder, which was taken on August 27th of 2013. He was a tourist, and he actually took a long video of the Loch Ness Monster. It's like a five-minute video of this mysterious wave in the loch. And according to Elder, the wave was produced by a 15-foot solid black object that was just under the surface of the water. He claims that he was taking a picture of a swan at the pier at the southwestern end of the lock, and he said that he saw movement, so he shot the movement. He said that the water was very still at the time, and 
that there were no ripples coming off the wave and no other activity on the water. It's interesting because in this whole five minute video, we never actually see the creature at all. All we see is the wave. To me, it's like in five minutes, you think you would get a better picture, but maybe the creature never came up. Maybe it was just swimming under the water and all there was was the wave to see, I don't know. The last one is from 2014. This is a really interesting one because this is the first and to my knowledge, the really the only picture of Nessie ever taken from a satellite in space. And it's from Apple Maps, believe it or not. A satellite image that was on Apple Maps showed what appeared to be a large creature just below the surface of Loch Ness. This was at the, the loch's far north side. The image appeared to be about 98 feet long. The idea of this particular image being a hoax is kind of far-fetched. How would you know when that thing's gonna get zoomed in to, to catch that photograph? What, do you just set something up in the lock and just leave it there for weeks and just hope that it gets photographed by, by Apple Maps who people at that time don't even really realize that it's taking pictures? You know what I mean? To me, it just doesn't seem like it's possible that that was a, a hoax of any kind. So that's basically a lot of the photographic and film evidence of this creature. Um, now, I think we'll, we'll try to talk about a little bit of, of what this thing might be. So, old boy, do you want to give your thoughts first on, on what you think this creature might be? I think it's a plesiosaur. I think Champ is, too. There's been so many sightings of this thing. I mean, there's always going to be hoax. We all know that. The 1933 picture, I believe that's fake. Some of the other ones, like you were just talking about, the, the Google Map one, I looked at that. The problem is they had a picture of a boat that actually they could tell was a boat, and it was half the size, and you could tell the boat was making waves, and this thing was underwater and had flippers. Whatever this is, it may not just be the luckless monster in there. You know, there may be bigger things in there that we don't know. Remember, this the lock's like, what, about 755 feet to 800 feet deep, and there's actually, they're saying there's a crack in one of the, it might even go deeper than that. This is a very deep lake. But the problem is you can't really see other than two feet. Once you jump in the water, it's like murky and dark. And they do have surgeon fish in there that grow about eight, nine feet. So that's what they think Nessie is anyway. I believe it's a plesiosaur. You're right. You're always going to have your st people saying it's going to be a wave or a, or a wake or some kind of otter or birds. And that's a bunch of crap because you know what? Here's the problem. When they did the video of Champ, they followed that thing. You can see there's something that's 20 feet long swimming on the water. The only thing is, I really hope they never find it because I know what will happen. They're probably going to kill it and take it apart and see what it is. I think there's more than one. I think there's a family of them. So that's my opinion. I really believe it is a plesiosaur. I don't know. What do you think, James? Okay, Loch Ness wasn't always landlocked. It opened up to the ocean at one time. It was completely frozen under ice for like 20,000 years. The time frame is a big problem for me. For, for it being a plesiosaur. That's the first part. Supposedly, plesiosaurs weren't around in the time that Loch Ness finally thawed out to where something could get into it. Now, that being said, they're not always right about that, okay? This is the least of my objections because that can very easily be overcome because they believe that the coelophant was extinct for millions of years and they, they found one within the last 50 years or something, right? Uh, off the coast of Madagascar. They're not always right about that. So I will say that with a definite grain of salt is that's the first problem. But that is only if the plesiosaur actually went extinct when they say it did. But their track record is not very good there. So it is possible that if this thing survived, it could have gotten into the lock. But my main problem with the idea of it being a plesiosaur is from everything we know and understand about the plesiosaur, it breathed air. If this thing breathes air, it's got to come up for air. And when it comes up for air, it's going to have to do that, even if it can hold its breath for a crazy amount of time. Some species and some animals, hours and hours before they have to come back up, right? But even if that's the case, let's say they, that this thing can even hold its breath for six hours at a time. That means at least four times a day this thing's got to come up for air. You have to have a breeding population in this lake, okay? In the lock, there has to be enough creatures to continually reproduce for there to be sightings going all the way back to the 1800s. That means you have a lot of these creatures in this lake, which means each individual creature has to come up for air at least four times a day, most likely with the majority of creatures that live in water that breathe air, the upper end of, of their ability to hold their breath is usually anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. Now you have a couple exceptions that can go a lot longer, but if that's the case, let's say it's an hour, you're talking 24 times a day, each one of these creatures has to come up to take a breath. Since the 30s, Loch Ness Monster has 
been super popular. And people have been looking for this thing all over the place on the lock. Now, if you have a breeding population of this creature that is coming up every hour for air, so you, you're talking dozens of these things at least, coming up for air every hour, there would have been a lot more pictures, a lot more film. There would, they would have definitely proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that this thing exists because we would have seen it. When we look at things like dolphins and whales, we see them all the time because they have to come up for air. The same thing would be true of the Loch Ness Monster if it was a plesiosaur because it would have to come up for air. It was so large that it's not like it's something you're going to miss. A lot of these pictures that we get are just little humps or something moving around under the water. You don't have any really good footage of this thing coming up out of the water to take a breath. All you have is humps. So what that tells me most likely of what this thing is, is some kind of sea creature that can breathe underwater. It doesn't have to come up for air. And what you're actually seeing is it just coming up near the surface to feed on whatever it feeds on. And you'll see like the hump of its back or tail or something like that as it gets near the surface. And when it starts to dive back down, that's when you'll see the humps as it goes back under the water. Or you'll just see a large object underneath the water. Those sonar images are another problem for me when, when you're talking plesiosaur because the one was like 475 feet, right? And the other one was 75 feet that, that I mentioned. There's been a whole lot of different sonar things done on the lake, but those are the two most prominent that had the best readings. Now on both of those, you're talking about a deep, deep object, okay? 75 feet, not so much. For 75 feet, to me, that's believable that a creature that believes there could potentially be that deep and then come back up. But when you're talking about 500 feet deep, for me, that's a little bit unbelievable that a creature that relies on oxygen to breathe from the air would go down and hang out for a long period of time at 500 feet deep. I would think that an air breathing creature would be a little bit closer to the surface most times because it doesn't want to be trapped way, way down there and then can't breathe and it's got to come up. So those are a couple of problems I have with the idea of a plesiosaur. Also, if you put any, any stock into the sightings that were on land from the people that say they saw this thing crossing the road, if it's a plesiosaur, there is absolutely no way that's going to happen. Okay, first of all, they said that the thing didn't have limbs, that it just kind of lurched its way across the, the road. Now, a plesiosaur has very pronounced limbs. It has very long flowing um, arms and legs that end in gigantic flipper looking things, okay? So there's no way you're missing those arms and legs. And there's also no way that this thing is gonna get up and move across the road. You know, this thing is gonna stay in the water. That's what it's designed for is to be in the water. It, there's no account uh, in history of plesiosaurs operating on land. They were always found in the water. If you put any kind of stock into that, the fact that this thing is sighted on land, then to me that rules out plesiosaur. Now the thing about a plesiosaur is, man, a plesiosaur fits the damn description perfect, don't it? I mean, it looks exactly like what you think the Loch Ness Monster should look like. So what I think it probably is, on a lot of the old maps that sailors back way, way long ago would make of the oceans, they would always put sea monsters on there. Now, a lot of people thought that this was just myth or scary sea tales. There have been a lot of accounts in a lot of the ship's logs about running into sea creatures and sea monsters, as they called them. And if you actually go back and you read a lot of these accounts, a lot of those sea monsters that they talk about, they kind of match the description of Nessie as well. So what I'm thinking might have happened, and this is not based on anybody else, this is just my personal theory. I think that potentially, since Loch Ness was at one time open to the ocean, if you have something that is open at one time to the ocean, I think some of these creatures, whatever the sea monster creatures are, I think that one of these creatures that there are all these eyewitness accounts of sailors running into, even people as, as well known as like Columbus, in one of his ship's logs, he talks about seeing a sea monster. I think one of these things swam into the lock when it was still open to the ocean, found that there was really good eating there, that it, it had plenty of fish to eat, I guess it couldn't have just been one creature, it had to be a couple at least. And they decided they were going to hang there because it was a good place. There wasn't nothing trying to kill them or eat them. And they had food. Then when the lock became landlocked, they just kind of became trapped there. They just kept on doing what animals do. They kept eating and breeding and increasing their number. That is how the breeding population exists and that's how the creature is still around. I think most likely it's something along those lines. I don't think that Loch Ness is some supernatural creature. 
I mean, being a supernatural creature would explain why it's been around for so long. Because you see varying sizes of this creature. That tells me that there's a breeding population, and it tells me that it's a biological creature. It is not out of the realm of possibility that this is some creature from the era of dinosaurs that has survived. Um, I believe that the sea monsters that the sailors used to talk about, I believe they're probably some form of dinosaur from that time period that lived in the ocean that was able to survive. There's a lot of creatures in the ocean that are still around that were around in that time period. And the ones that we know of that died off, we're really not even sure that they died off. We just haven't seen them in a while. But when you're talking about an ocean that goes miles deep and some of the things that are down in the bottom of that ocean, we don't even know what the hell's down there. You know, every time we take a submersible sub down there, we see all kinds of cool stuff we've never seen before. The idea that we know all about the ocean and the idea that these things don't exist because we would know it if they did is kind of silly when you're talking about the ocean. It really is the final frontier. I mean, we have not explored the ocean very well at all. We've been around the top of the ocean, and even as much as we've traveled on top of the ocean, there are still islands out there we haven't discovered yet that we find. Down deep in the ocean, we don't really know much about at all. The idea that some of these things could actually still be around is very possible. So maybe it's some form of like a sea dragon, like a sea monster thing that made its way into the lock. I mean, that's my theory on what it is. I, I like that theory. It could be that too. It could be uh, some kind of sea monster because what's not forget they said the giant squid didn't exist and they have video of it now down in the ocean about 70 80 feet long squid what i think is i agree with the one story I'll, i we can both agree on that i think a, a school of them found a good you know fishing place or where they they had a good fishing you know but i and you also can remember oh it turned into fresh water from salt water so they could have they could have adapted it could have just been a creature that could do both you have examples of that in nature now like the bull shark, for example. The bull shark is lives out in the ocean, which is salt water, but it is perfectly comfortable coming inland into the river system. There was that whole thing in New Jersey where there was multiple attacks by bull sharks in the river, and some of them up to like 100, 150 miles inland in the river system. So you have examples of exactly what you're saying in species of animals today that can do both. I just wanted to get that out there while I was thinking about it, brother. Go ahead. I also believe there are sea serpents, too. I believe there's giant creatures because they have pitch, and these things are really long, two, three hundred feet. I believe they belong, I believe they do exist in the ocean. I wouldn't doubt some of these things exist. I, I, I say some of it's hoax. We all know that. But I really do believe they're, they exist. I mean, I, I think we both agree. I don't know what it is. There's lore on what the Loch Ness Monster is. Some say it was a it is a magical creature. Some people say a Lester Cowley was around that area, was doing a lot of spells. And we, that's, a whole, that, that's, a, that's a theory, too. That's, that's a theory that Alexander Cowley brought that creature on. And, and you said it was in the 18 and 1900s. But I don't believe that. I've heard that story before. I believe Nessie exists. I don't know what it is, though. I, I really don't want to sit here. To, I, don't, I don't know what I could think it is. It could be a plesiosaur. It could be some kind of relative to that. It could be a giant, you know, well. A lot, some people think it's a giant well, a new species of well. That's another theory. It could be a whole new species of some kind of animal. What do you think about that one? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If, if it's something that is from the ocean that came in, it could be something we haven't even discovered yet. Now, this is, we're just kind of looking at this as a biological creature right now. But the interesting thing is, like you said, there is lore on what this thing could possibly be. Some people think that the Loch Ness Monster is actually a Kelpie because in the beginning, of the sightings and the lore on the Loch Ness Monster, it looked a little bit different than it does now. And I thought it was very interesting when you were talking about how Oko Poco supposedly has like a horse head, because in the original, the original legends of the Loch Ness Monster that go way, way back, the description of it, some of the people described it as having a horse-like head. They associate it with the legends of the Kelpie, which the Kelpie was like a aquatic horse-like creature. They would basically come up out of the water and grab you and pull you in and like eat you. You know what I mean? So there is lore 
on the Loch Ness Monster that is associated with the lore on the Kelpie. And maybe we'll do a show someday on the Kelpie and everything like that when we have more time and really get into that legend as well. I just thought that was very interesting when you brought up the Ogopogo thing because it kind of ties in with the original lore of this creature before all the photographs and before it kind of evolved into what it is now. I think originally when people saw this thing in Loch Ness, they probably identified it as a Kelpie. They described it the way you would describe a Kelpie. They saw something and said, oh my god, what is that? Uh, it's some kind of aquatic monster. It must be a Kelpie, right? See, people nowadays don't really know what a Kelpie is. People nowadays don't really know what a lot of these creatures are anymore because that lore is not passed on anymore. I mean, it's really a dying art of knowing a lot of what these creatures are and what they did and what they look like and all that kind of stuff. That's one of the reasons why we like to do shows like this. And like when we did the show on the Kappa a while ago, I try to do shows like that with Old Boy because we try to pass on a little bit of that knowledge that is kind of forgotten. It's kind of becoming a thing of the past where people just don't know it anymore. It wasn't always that way. Back hundreds of years ago, people were a lot more familiar with a lot of this lore because they really believed that these creatures existed. I'm not talking just about Kelpie. I'm talking about all the different lore creatures. They really believed in, in werewolves and, and vampires and all these things. They believed that they existed on Earth and that they were a danger to them. People were taught this lore as children because it was a way of warning them and, and letting them know, hey, this is dangerous. This is here and it's dangerous. The same way that we teach our children about snakes or bears or whatever the threat in your area is, you make sure that your children know about it and what to do if they see one and all that kind of stuff. That's the way it was a couple hundred years ago with a lot of this lore. As time progressed, we kind of moved away from that and we just don't teach each other that stuff anymore. There are a lot of people now that that they don't even believe that any of this stuff exists. But back then they did. So I think most likely what happened in the beginning was they saw something, they didn't know what it was. It's rather impressive looking and intimidating looking. So they say it's a monster. So in their mind, they think aquatic monster. They equate that with Kelpie. So when they describe it, maybe they didn't get a very good look at it, but they know what a Kelpie is supposed to look like, so they describe it as that. I think most likely that that is what happened. I think that's where the original Loch Ness Monster descriptions come from, is from the lore. They saw something and, and, and said, this is what it has to be, so this is what it's supposed to look like. I think that, that would explain why... Nessie has changed over the years in what people think that, that it looks like. I, I think you're totally right. I That's how I think. I think they're all pretty similar creatures. The only difference is I think some of them are a little different. And I think that I think some of them are not even the same creature. I, I You know, like you were saying, I think the one kind of looks like that. We got to do a show about that anyway. I, I, I got to agree with you. I, I don't see no... I think people have changed it, though, what it looks like to make it get... You also got to remember, I think people made it, you know, look this certain way so people would go and check it out, you know, and go see if it's real. So they made it more appealing because you're not going to chase after something that's ugly. You know, if you see what they did, like, at top Center, that's when I first saw Nessie. They made a movie, and they made him, you know, cute, like the water horse. You've seen that movie, The Water Horse? That That's pretty much what they, they made, you know, Nessie really cute at the beginning, and then turns into this giant horse-looking monster, And and but it's actually a really good, it's really a good, only, there's only one exists, but I think they made it sound like that, so people will go you know, spend money to go look at it because it brings money. That's what it all comes down to is I say there's something in this lake while well, millions of people are going to want to see this. So I make it look like a certain way. So that's what people are looking for when it could be opposite of what the hell they're looking for in the first place. So, you know, if you look at that picture that Apple shows, that's a different kind of creature than what you're seeing regularly, what they think it is, a plesiosaur. It doesn't even look like that. But it's huge. It's like 96 feet tall, uh, long, you said. So, I mean, it, it's crazy. It could be something else. It could be a whole different thing than what we think it is. I think that's the, the magical thing about all of this. And not just with Nessie, but with a lot of these cryptic creatures, is we don't know. And that's the beauty of it. That's what makes it fun and exciting for me and interesting is because it's a mystery that needs to be solved. And it, it's a lot of fun. Nessie's a great subject. I love Nessie a, a whole bunch. I've always been fascinated with the idea 
of the Loch Ness Monster and trying to figure out just what in the hell this thing actually is. Because I, I believe that there's something there. I just, I don't exactly know what it is. I mean, I gave my theory. I think that's probably the most likely. But until we really have a body to examine, I think we're not going to know. That's the sad part and, you know, the interesting part about the whole thing. I mean, because I actually hope that these things do exist, not because I want one to be killed, but just I really love that whole magical idea of all of these creatures that we don't know exist actually existing. You know, to me, that makes the world a much better place. I love that idea. And I'm a guy that really believes in a lot of those things that go bump in the night. I believe that a lot of these things actually exist. Some I've seen, some I haven't seen, some I have... Uh, interviewed people that swear up and down they've seen and some of these people have been very very reputable people they're not crackpots they're not you know people that are flaky in any way they're doctors lawyers scientists people that have reputations to, to worry about so they're not just going to make up some nonsense story and I don't know I've seen enough in my lifetime to really believe that a lot of these things exist and I've I've done a, a a lot of extensive study of the lore of a lot of these different things and it's something that has been a lifelong love and passion for me and, and I'm sure for old boy as well we're a couple guys that have loved this stuff since we were children and now I'm in a position where I can do this show and I can take this lifetime of knowledge that I've accumulated and kind of disseminate it to everybody else you know anybody who's interested can go to the channel and watch it completely free and just check it out and enjoy it and just share that love of the unknown with us that's kind of the cool thing about the title of the show staring into the abyss because in a way you're almost saying also we're kind of staring into the unknown you know what i mean we we like to to examine these things that most people are either too afraid to talk about or they just dismiss as not being real but if you really dig into a lot of these things, man, you find that there's a nugget of truth there. In, in almost every one of these legends, there's a nugget of truth. And it's about weeding through the nonsense and getting to the truth of the matter. That's something that that really drives me. I, I want to find the answer to, to all these questions. I really do. And I, I put a lot of time and, and effort and work into researching and trying to find these answers. And it's just it's fun for us to do the show it's fun for us to talk about it and hopefully it's fun for you guys to listen to it so if you enjoyed it you know hit like subscribe to the channel check out our other shows like i said before they're all there 100 percent free for you so that you can enjoy them thank you brother and i want to thank everybody from para x i appreciate you guys over 6100 6, subscribers on youtube check out james hershey's youtube page i'll tell you where to go we got merchandise, shirts, cups, whatever you want. We can get it for you, pretty much. Some stuff we can't, like, we can get you sweaters and stuff. I don't know about beanies yet. We, we're working on those. But you guys want to check that? He'll tell you where to go. I appreciate all you guys. You have a great night. Blessed be Sugar Ladies Misfits. Monster lovers, have a great night. I love you. The YouTube channel is youtube.com slash James Hershey Jr. There you will find every episode of Staring into the Abyss. You will find every episode of the TV show Tales from the Abyss. And you will find a bunch of other paranormal news and different paranormal videos. There's hundreds and hundreds of videos there. 100% free. Please go check out the channel, like the videos, and subscribe to the channel. That would be awesome. The merchandise store is teespring.com slash stores slash Staring into the Abyss. That's T-E-E-S-P-R-I-N-G dot com slash stores with an S on the end, slash staring into the abyss. That's where all the merch is. There's t-shirts, hoodies, pants, pillows, cell phone cases, posters, all kinds of stuff there. So if you're into merch and you want something with staring onto it, that's where you go and get it. Um, thank you guys so much for all your support and all the love. Thank you for listening. And until we speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. God loves you, and so do we. Bye-bye.